Uh, via telephone, we welcome in our first guest, Senator Patricia Rucker, who knows a bit about being inconvenienced by traffic uh, as well while they're redoing the rocks in Harper's Ferry. Good morning, Senator Rucker. How are you? Good morning. How is everyone? I am well, thank you. I, I tell you, they did a nice job going through Harper's Ferry. I don't think there's been an issue since they redid that whole area. Well, uh -oh, uh -oh. <laughs> I'm sorry to be the Debbie Downer, <laughs> but um, there hasn't been an issue on 340. But as you know, they didn't. They, I won't go into the reasons. Um, chose not to include Chestnut Hill Road. And we've had several uh, rock slides on Chestnut Hill Road. I have, I have not used Chestnut Hill Road on my, on my drive through. I just used 340, and that's been flowing very well. I'm sorry to hear that Chestnut has been an issue, too. That's too bad. It would have been yeah, nice. I, I was just disappointed that they didn't take care of it at the same time. Okay. But their explanation was, well, it's, we had money from the federal government only to do an interstate and not our own road and of course that begs the question but the state of west virginia could have done our own yeah. road anyways yeah. was there always a, something was there a bid for chestnut hill road to know how much that would cost well so the, it was my understanding when we were asking them to take care of this problem it always included chestnut hill road and we assumed that was what the project was until they actually started doing the project and only then did they say, well, no, it's only going to be 340. But yet it was Chestnut Hill Road that was also closed and it had to be closed because that whole cliff, this one cliff, they, I, I just, there's no explanation why they could not have taking care of it all but anyway yeah because you couldn't really use chestnut hill road while a 340 was closed exactly so it would have made more sense so is that something that you're going to be trying to get done if you should get another term so i will be honest it, it's i really it's really really a huge inconvenience to close that road down and it would mean closure of 340 because they cannot work on that cliff without closing 340. The risk of rocks falling is too dangerous. So I don't know whether um, it even makes any sense to mm -hmm. advocate for that again. It was such, such a just absolute nightmare for the folks here in this area who needed to go to work. So when there's an issue on Chestnut Hill Road, is it trees or rocks? It's mostly rocks and, you know, various sizes, but even a small rock can bust your tire, as I can attest. <laughs> Is that it's where happened you... to me. It's happened to almost everyone that lives on the mountain. Is that where you lost uh, your tire on Chestnut Hill or is it more on 340? No, on Chestnut Hill. Oh, okay. I mean, you have a small two-lane road that's very curvy. You go around a curve, you don't even know rocks have fallen. Very difficult to avoid a rock. And that's that's a difficult access point for 340 anyway because of the way that road is shaped and dumps out onto 340. Is there an issue that's large enough there that would warrant reconstructing that intersection? Well, there are many who have complained about it. And, of course, as you can imagine, there are lots of accidents. But to be completely fair, I don't see how that is an unstable cliff. I don't know how you would expand, make it larger, make it straighter. It, I just, very, very difficult to do. And of course, I'm not going to be advocating for closure of the road, no. which would probably make sense to some due to the, you know, how dangerous that road can be. But goodness, you close that road and you have cut off um, literally uh, thousands of people from being able to get to Maryland in a reasonable time. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one of the reasons for why folks moved to that area in the first place. So I just don't know how we could. So it is a very serious and dangerous road. I can tell you when it, it's icy, I do not go down that way no matter what i always go around the other way through route dime well that's gravity as much as anything it's that's a pretty hilly road it is it's hilly it's curvy and like i said you got ice on there good luck right yeah tough left turn too on the 340
Uh, and in fact, if you're off coming down 340 trying to make that right up to go up Chestnut Hill, that's a difficult right turn, especially if there's somebody waiting to come out the other end and go right on 340. Uh, anyway. Yeah, the folks. The folks here pretty much know what they, you know, have to navigate it, and you have to make a really wide turn. Mm -hmm. The way to do it, uh, Senator. Let's talk about the two appearances you've had with uh, John Doyle in the Senate race, which has been quite unique because you've chosen to not use a moderator and uh, kind of self-policing with the audience uh, in, in the Q and As and such. We had John on yesterday. He gave it glowing reviews. What are your thoughts on the two that you've had already? Oh, well, I wish I'd heard John. I'm sorry I didn't, but um, I, I feel it went really well. It is just as I hoped. Um, we had a really polite, intelligent discussion. We agreed on some things. We disagreed on others, but we always kept it courteous. And the audience was pretty well behaved. Um, I, I Only one time I had to kind of stop someone who just wasn't getting to her question but um, that, that's literally it, no, no other issues. And, um, and I felt that we had diverse opinions, folks from both political uh, ends of the spectrum that showed up to ask questions, and I, I, think, I think it really went well. You did these October 1 and October 15. October 1 was at Shepherd, and October 15 was in uh, Inwood. Was there a difference uh, between the two in regards to energy or uh, crowd atmosphere questions that you got? Yes, of course. Undoubtedly, it was a little bit of a different feel and, and atmosphere. And um, I, I will tell you that I was very happy that at Shepherd we had so much students that came. Um, and I think it filled the room. We didn't quite fill the room at uh, Muslim in high school, but yeah, it was a good attendance also. But different, you know, different um, feel in, in the room. Um, clearly, the one at Shepherd had more questions directed towards me, and the one at Muslim had a few more questions directed at John. But always, you know, polite questions. There wasn't anything that we, you know, I, w I would consider foul or unfair. When I asked John yesterday this question, uh, he said that it worked because of the relationship the two of you had. I asked, uh, is this something you'd recommend to other candidates to try since it worked for the two of you? What would be your answer to that, Senator? So I think so. I, and I will tell you, most of my fellow legislators that I know, both delegates and senators, they, they like John and I, they do show respect for each other and others, and they, they don't have any problem expressing their opinions in a way that's not attacking another person. I think what's important is that they be willing to agree to do it, to just participate in something like this. It is a little bit of pressure. You have no idea what's going to be asked. It's completely up to the folks that show up. But if you just... Um, agree to those ground rules of there will be no name calling, there will be no, you know, att personal attacks, um, you know, everyone's going to be polite or courteous, so you'll be asked to leave. I mean, clearly f the folks in the audience knew how to behave, and as long as you were behaving also, I think it would be a very good format. I'll tell you one of the reasons I really enjoyed it, n not just because it was John and, you know, he's great and we get along well, but we had the opportunity to fully answer instead of um, just the one or two minutes we're given on most forms to answer. And that really just makes a huge difference. Folks are getting a lot more depth to our answers mm -hmm. and understanding where we're coming from, which is really difficult to do in one or two minutes. Well, let me point out that uh, next Tuesday, the 22nd, both you and John will be at our forum at the Berkeley County Commission Chamber Meeting Room, and you'll have a full hour there between 8.30 and uh, 9.30 to continue the discussion here. What emerged okay. as some of the biggest differences between you and John in regards to the questions that you took and the subjects that it really stood out? So obviously um, the social issues, <laughs> like um, folks, we were asked about our positions on abortion. We were asked on our positions on uh, public education. We were asked for our positions on gun rights. Um, Second Amendment specifically, those were, I think, the ones that 
was very clear that we were on different um, sides. But, I mean, I will tell you, it was surprising how many things we could agree on. Um, and, and again, it was just all based on what the folks that showed up were interested in hearing about. What, in regards to the Shepherd meeting and then the Inwood meeting, what were the differences in terms of the subject matters that came up, or were they both fairly similar? I think they were fairly similar. There was a slight difference, um, but not too much. I think the shepherd had a little bit more of a broad um, questions. They they asked about things that were beyond just, like I said, right and left issues. That we were asked about housing at both, but at shepherd we were asked about more things that had to do with like the community and how can we keep kids in the state. Um, and what can we do to increase um, participation? So there was a little bit more of that. And at the one at Musselman, it was basically cut and dry of right and left issues. Although, like I said, the housing was asked us at both. So housing issues seem to be a very important concern for the folks of this area. Senator, I've, I've long believed that education is the key to everything. If we can solve the education problems, everything will flow from that. We will attract more people to the state. People will make more money that, that live here. Everything will flow from that. And as we know, we are troubled in education. I'm looking at your website right here, and, and it's one of the, the, the key planks in, in your platform. And in here, you talk about uh, being against Common Core and, and, and some other issues. <sighs> Those are determined, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, those are determined in West Virginia at the executive level, not at the legislative level, right? So, it, it is, first of all, is that correct? And if it is correct, as a senator, are you looking at, at sort of dismantling and, and potentially reassembling the entire education system so that it becomes more accountable to the legislature than just to the executive branch? Well... I think that the word dismantling is not quite accurate, but I do think that we do need to have legislative oversight like we do over all state agencies um, of government. Um, yes, there's an executive branch. No one's going to take that away. But the issue with the State Board of Education in West Virginia is that the Supreme Court uh, made a decision several years ago that they do not have to follow law that they are the ultimate authority in terms of how to run education in the state, which means that we can pass legislation and they can take it as, you know, advice, not as a mandate. So that makes it very difficult for us when we, the legislators, get pretty much all the blame for, you know, things are not happening or should be happening and we need to reform and do this differently, but we actually don't have the power to do so, even though the funding is, of course, coming, the majority of the funding coming from us. So what we tried to do a couple years ago with that constitutional amendment, it was number four on the ballot, was just to say that the rules, the rules that the uh, State Board of Education comes up with would actually have to go through legislative approval, that's what we that is the only way that we have any oversight over the state agencies also in the state so it's not that we are micromanaging taking over dismantling nothing like that but just that there would be some oversight that the rules actually reflect the intent of uh the legislature and the citizens um of west virginia because as you know the state board of education is not an elected body so the only accountability that there is is the us sits with us in the legislature as of right now. So Amendment 4 failed. Um, I, have, I have opinions for why it failed, but that's, that, that's yesterday, right? So if, you're, mm -hmm. if you are reelected, put that in the form of a plan. What do you see for the future for how to fix it, fix what is broken tomorrow? Wow. Well, there is no such thing as an overnight solution or even a one-year solution. Well, it step is, um, one, you know. Yeah, step one, I, I will tell you. So in this forum, I mentioned to folks that what really makes the biggest difference when it comes to public education, and you can look this up, you can read studies, you can go to conferences, I do all those different things, 
But what is really the most dramatic difference is having good leadership. If you have a good principal, good superintendent, you're going to see change. You're going to see a change in culture. You're going to see priorities shifted. You're going to see a dramatic change in how that school does. It is the singular biggest and fastest way to actually change things. So one of the things I want to do, plan A, like you were saying, step A, we need to return because we started this and then COVID interrupted it. We need to return to having a leadership training in the state where we are helping the good superintendents and principals that we have help others become good also. The more we have good leadership, the better our schools are going to be. So that is number one for me, at least. And, and in, that, in that context, what does good leadership look like? What are we talking about? So leadership that is, again, encouraging that good culture where pe- folks are held responsible if they do something wrong, but they are encouraged and motivated and rewarded when they do the right things. And when I say folks, we're talking everyone that's underneath them. So obviously principals and superintendents are going to have different, you know, folks that are underneath them. But like in a regular school, we're talking teachers, the resource officers, the directors, the folks that greet at the door, the um, custodians, the cooks, the all the support personnel. The principal has a huge impact on how well that school is run. And if that principal is on top of things and is responsive and there is accountability when someone is not doing their job, it is amazing how often I hear from school personnel. It is it is just such a difficult thing for them to maintain their morale and to continue to be working hard and doing the right thing when they see others not doing the right thing and they are all treated the same. That just never that just never works. It really makes you feel like, well, why should I keep trying? Why should I, you know, do all the extra things that I'm doing to make my classroom exciting and fun and welcoming and I just get treated exactly the same as the one that doesn't do anything. So there is a lot of those things you can't really put into law. You're not going to change through legislation, but you can make a difference by having good leaders. So how do we, I'm going to guess, um, I'm pretty confident in this, that the problems that are faced by Berkeley and Jefferson counties are significantly different than the ones that are faced by Lewis County and Mon County and Mingo County. How do we account for for the changes that are necessary, the differences in the changes that are necessary in the different parts of the state, which are really almost different states in, 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 in terms of the structure and the economics? Obviously, there are different challenges, but this is one of the reasons for why we allow and support as much local control as we can. Um, the education reform bill that we passed in 2019 actually returned a lot of the power, took it out of Charleston and gave it directly to the school boards because we do believe that it should be a local, locally addressed issue in most cases. And in terms of the challenges facing the folks here locally, I mean, obviously, we have incredible turnover. That is a huge problem. It is very difficult for us to retain our teachers. And then the ones that we do retain, we need to do everything that we can to just continue to support them and give them all the help um, and, and, and reward for staying because they all could get paid more if they left. The other difficulty that we have is this growing population. Um, from my understanding of talking to the folks on the ground, the kids are just very different. Um, COVID seemed to have really exacerbated behavioral issues and mental health issues. And it is really difficult, I hear, um, to get the kids to pay attention and to focus and to listen. And um, it, I, I really, I will tell you, it's gotten to the point that we are actually um, mandating training in how to handle this type of behavioral and mental issues for those who are learning to become teachers in the state of West Virginia. It's actually become part of their education that 
they must get classes on how to handle, how to respond. And I don't know if you've heard that we have a pilot program to pay and have a behavioral interventionist in Berkeley County. It's supposed to be analyzed, I think, at the end of this year to see how well it has helped with the situation in Berkeley. And if they, we find that it made a big difference, we may choose as a legislature to fund that for all of the counties. But we have been putting millions of dollars into things like communities in schools and into mental and um, counseling support for the students. I think we we might have to start doing some of that for our teachers also. Senator Rucker, we're just about out of time. Sounds like we're going to have to wait another uh, eight or nine years until this entire generation works its way through the school system until you get kids who are back in schools who will spend their entire time from pre-K all the way through their senior years without having been exposed to the COVID situation. Gosh, I, I really hope it doesn't take that long. But I will tell you that it is a, it is really tragic, just yeah. very tragic. Well, you have a great day. I appreciate all the time you've given us. We look forward to seeing you next Tuesday at our forum. Great. Thank you so much.